I'd like to thank Dr. Schoenkeen and Dr. Um, McHale for inviting me to take part in this. And thank you all for coming to hear me out. Hopefully I won't be too big uh, but we're going to try to go over some topic, uh, some topics today. Obviously, I've been uh, in charge to put together a lecture for you guys on EDD management. I kind of went above and beyond because that's just who I am. Uh, to discuss lumbar drains, because <clears throat> I do think uh, I have had some patients in our ICU here that we manage with lumbar drains uh, for various reasons. So I just figured we would kind of brush over that uh, aspect of it. But really, this talk is about EDD management. Up was uh, intracranial pressure monitoring. So hopefully uh, I'll try to be quick, but if there's any questions, feel free to uh, raise your hand. Now. I have brought a few things that uh, you guys can pass around or we can keep up at the front and can come by and take a look at that reference the, the topic as it's uh, at hand. So really as far as As far as what we're going to be discussing, uh, you know, we're going to be going over the EBD management, the placement, usually <clears throat> done by myself or our team here uh, in the uh, ED to the ICU setting to the, um, excuse me, to the OR. Uh, lumbar drain management as well, the equipment that's associated with that. Uh, and then, you know, we will, I'll brush over CSF's uh, sampling and testing, but we usually do that uh, kind of again, uh, that's done by myself or our team here. We try to minimize the amount of people that uh, uh, do CSF sampling to obviously, for epidemiologic reasons, to minimize the infection, which obviously we're going to go through. It's probably the biggest concern when related to EBDs and lumbar drains as they're located as a more invasive uh, procedure. So just to kind of go over the basics, for basic science, you know, CSF is, as some of you have seen, colorless clear fluid produced in the choroid plexus, uh, which is located within the third and fourth ventricles. We make about 500 to 600 cc's a day. The easiest thing, since we're all Chicago, not the majority of us, uh, 23 cc's an hour. It's easy to remember, Michael Jordan. That's really what's produced, so it's important to, re to remember that, because it's really important to understand when drain in the drainage of patients. You know, we usually write a standing order with the majority of our patients when we manage uh, EDDs is, to notify the physician to clamp the EVD device when greater than 30 cc's a shift, or 30 cc's, excuse me, an hour uh, is uh, produced out of the drainage cavity. Because as you can tell, if you're only producing 23 cc's an hour, you don't want to overdrain the patient for fear of uh, subdural hematomas or other intracranial pathology that can arise. So about 125 to 150 cc's are circulating within the ventricular system or subarachnoid space at any given point in time. And there are four ventricular uh, or intraventricular systems. There's the paired lateral ventricles down through the third ventricle, which then passes via the foramen and the row, or excuse me, via the um, cerebral aqueduct into the fourth ventricle, and then out down into the lumbar cistern. ICP obviously is the reason why we put the EDD in ICP management or ICP control. There are three constituent uh, portions that really are involved with an integral portion of ICP. That's your cerebral tissue, cerebral spinal fluid, obviously, which is what gets diverted by the EDD, and then your intravascular volume or intravascular blood. Uh, these are these three things stay in a constant state of equilibrium, and <clears throat> it is when something is added to this process, so some sort of intracranial pathology, whether it's a cerebral contusion, a intracranial bleed, a brain tumor, that then changes your normal autoregulation. I didn't put that slide in here, which I think all of us have seen significantly, is that exponential rise in ICP when the autoregulation is off. There's a very finite line where the brain will autoregulate all these three constituents. Initially, when there's some sort of intracranial process going on, you'll have shunting of blood from your intravascular spaces in the brain. That's the first thing that will uh, happen or the first thing that the body does. That's why it's important as we go through this talk, you'll see some of the initial interventions that you as nursing staff will do when you have patients with elevated uh, ICP with EDDs in place or some sort of monitoring system is ensuring that their jugular veins are nice and midline, that their head is straight so that the passage and the venous outflow is not obstructed, which can erroneously elevate your uh, intracranial pressure. The next thing that your brain does or your body will do is shunt CSF via the arachnoid villi. And I can only do that to a certain extent, which then at that point in time is when brain tissue starts moving around. And that's when you get your various herniation syndromes. 
So what I kind of discussed, that's the idea of the monroe Kelly hypothesis, that all these components will stay in a constant state of equilibrium, and once the ICP or the pressure increases, those three components will fluctuate or change in an appropriate fashion to accommodate this uh, until a certain point when that cannot be done, which is when we have an exponential rise and something needs to be done by uh, your support staff, uh, which would be your neurosurgical team, uh, either placement of an EDD catheter to shunt the CSF or some sort of surgical procedure, obviously. What is normal ICP? So I just kept this talk to maintain within uh, adult management. I didn't want to go into the pediatric uh, areas because I hate it. Um, but <laughs> we'll just make it easy for you. Normal ICP is 0 to 10. I mean, that's what we're monitoring for and that's what we're looking at. ICP will rise, and that's not inappropriate to say that 10 to 20 is not an inappropriate number, but that's when you need to start monitoring things a little bit more closely with your patients. I'm not saying that you need to call me every five minutes when that happens when you're at 12, but I'm saying that we need to start looking at some other measures to see where we're going, what, uh, what is changing. And it's obviously it's these steady inclines that we've been, been concerned for uh, as far as intervention. Sustained levels above 20, and that's just another standing order for our patients here, is a constituent of a neurosurgical emergency or something that needs to be uh, bumped up the chain of command, so to speak. When I was a resident, my attendees used to always say, when stuff's going bad at night, load the boat, so call everybody, right? You don't want to be standing there by yourself trying to maintain or manage these things. So just because there's a standing order in place or some form of algorithm that Everyone lives by algorithm. Something that we've decided to institute doesn't necessarily mean that a phone call shouldn't be done, just to kind of assess that the appropriate measures are being taken. So moving forward, as we discussed, this Monroe Kelly hypothesis and that, that kind of doctrine, so to speak, is really what we all abide by in neurosciences, and that's why we get into placement of EVDs is to manage the cerebral perfusion pressure. So these are things that you're going to be constantly monitoring. Right, your ICU patients have monitors in, whether you're assessing CPP by a central line. Art lines, hopefully, usually all of our patients that have EDDs in place, we try to be as invasive as possible in trying to manage them by placing art lines and doing other things that are necessary because those patients are pretty sick. So you want to know your MAP and you want to know your ICP. When you get an EDD, an EDD's place is attached to a transducer that gives you a direct ICP recording and then that gives you your cerebral. There's a lot of kind of back and forth in the trauma literature as far as the importance of cerebral perfusion pressure. Whether it's more important to maintain a CPP above 50 or 60, as you can see here, normal 60 to 80. They say not to push it too high because if you're pushing the cerebral perfusion pressure too high, you'd be like, oh, well, why not 100? You're also causing a significant increase in the intravascular pressure or your mean arterial pressure, which can potentially lead to a significant amount of pulmonary edema. That's one of the most pretty that are the uh, largest complications with uh, precipitous or uh, steady increases in ICP. So that's why there's or CPP, excuse me. That's why there's this uh, kind of window of opportunity to maintain adequate cerebral perfusion. As we discussed, what are the things that can potentially cause elevations or rises in ICP? You're looking at your cerebral contusions, hematomas, intraparenchymal. Uh, Epidural hematomas, subdural hematomas causing shift. Here are tumors of any sort. Uh, infarcts can also potentially rise and cause that. And that's obviously, I think, the topic of the conversation today with strokes and MCA infarcts. Fluid overload can definitely be of concern and propagate the situation, but it's not like fluid overload is the only constituent component. But that's why it's important that in these patients you monitor CPP and maintain that at a normal pressure. Normal. Positive end expiratory pressure repeat at the end of a pulmonary cycle for ventilated patients is definitely a potential cause because of that positive end expiratory pressure then causes a backflow uh, causing venous hypertension, which subsequently then increases your ICP. So it's like the idea that like, one's connected to the, everything's interconnected here. Obviously in your cases with your patients, endotracheal suctioning, uh, these patients I know when we, in my training, uh, the nurses would potentially at times, if they were obviously an innovative, sedated patient that was on medications, they would give them a bolus of some form of sedation to minimize uh, <coughs> the bucking and the potential <coughs> elevations in ICP that could occur when beginning to do uh, endotracheal suction if they were had significant uh, suction requirements. I'm not saying that every patient should be bolus at when they do endotracheal suction. 
Increased CSF production is an interesting one. That's usually associated with those patients that have a tumor in, this, in the intraventricular space that can be producing extra CSF. Normal pressure hydrocephalus, those situations, and that's kind of what we may be discussing today. So, as far as measuring ICP, when do you do that? By Classically, we do it in patients with a GCS of less than 8. Those are those patients with severe traumatic injury. Uh, some sort of intracranial component that is leading them to have a significantly blunted neurologic exam. I won't go through that. Uh, I'm sure all of you know what the glass blood scale is. Other reasons for doing it going on, cerebral edema. In those patients with stroke, uh, MCA infarcts significantly get this malignant edema, which then leads to elevated intracranial pressure, leading on to uh, significant uh, ICP elevations in masses or your tumors. And moving on, you can see some of the other reasons. Again, craniosynostosis is one of those things for more pediatric related than it is for adult. So what is ICP recording or monitoring in the setting and what, what is the importance of EVD? Well, obviously the EVD is the most is the gold standard. The idea with the intracranial monitor, your amino monitors, or bolts, so to speak, is that you aren't able to divert CSF. So while you're able to get an ICP recording, you're not able to really do anything invasively about it. While you can give them some of the measures which we'll be talking about uh, that we can do secondarily to minimize their ICP, you can't do uh, much else. And so that's why EVD is ideal. EVD is obviously an invasive procedure that's placed uh, at the bedside, as we discussed, or in the OR. Uh, into the ventricular system. And classically, the placement of it is via uh, Coker's point, which is a point that's about 11 centimeters back from the nasion and about 2.5 centimeters over to the right or the left, depending on handedness or tumor location or something. Uh, the idea is placing it off the midline. You're placing it away from the sagittal sinus, which is running here. And by placing it 11 centimeters back, about 14 to 15 centimeters back, is your primary motor strip. Obviously, you don't want to place it close to that because you have either a hematoma forming right at your catheter insertion point that then leads to a potential injury to the motor strip, uh, or obviously going straight through the motor strip and potentially leading to injury. The EVD is then tunneled out the skin, connected to a trans uh, to the back of drainage bag, which I've placed here. And like I said, you guys can pass it around. I think if I, I'm sure many of you have seen them. The one thing I will point out, as we'll discuss in the talk. I didn't open this up because we have supply issues. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I would get yelled at. It would come up and check for um, What you'll see here is there's millimeters of mercury and centimeters of water. So it's always important that when your surgeon gives you an order after placing the EBD for what drainage they want it set up at, it, per my experiences, and it could be some, there are some neurosurgeons that are going to based upon one person. You can pass it around from the back or um, is basically you're going to try to set it up, what we set it up is it's centimeters of water. So what that means is that's the pressure. Uh, that tells you what, at what pressure. So say, for example, we put an EVD in and we set it at 10. So if the ICP is above 15, 10 centimeters of water, you'll obviously get a drain If you look there, the corresponding millimeters of mercury is varying. So that can be very detrimental to your patients. You know, 15 is not... 15 millimeters of mercury is not really 10 centimeters of water. So you can potentially get into situations where you may not be doing the appropriate thing based upon the pathology that's present. So what are the biggest disadvantages, as we discussed? The number one and most detrimental disadvantage to your patient is that of infection. You basically just opened up a direct pathway into their meninges. And this can obviously be of significant importance. We used to have a lot of patients uh, that we used to have EVDs in with strokes specifically that would go to an our training institution or mine that would go to get medical ICU. And it would be very difficult to manage those patients as residents who are always in the, uh, our own uh, neuro ICU monitoring these patients. We ended up getting a bunch of patients, and I think I've told this story multiple times, so forgive me if you've heard this, but we ended up having a drawn in the residency with a lot of uh, E. coli meningitis. We didn't know what was going on, and so epidemiology got bored and started watching us and making sure that I wore a mask and gloves and blah, 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 blah. And what we found out is those patients, unfortunately, and this goes on to what we were going to be, as we're discussing today, is maintaining your PBD in a very sterile or as sterile of an environment. So you, if you take those sterile sheets or something to wrap around it and not connect it to the rest of your tubing, we found out some of our obviously very intelligent and awesome MIC nurses 
had unfortunately been taking our EBDs and wrapping them with the ET tube and the NG tube in one whole bundle. And so obviously the GI system attached to the EBD, next thing you know, patients are pretty septic and sick. It wasn't a good thing. Well, I still got shut down for the um, So infection, suffice it to say, is the biggest and most important thing. So it's important that if your uh, physicians place these catheters and don't tell you otherwise, uh, ensure that they're on some sort of uh, appropriate prophylaxis and meiosis, usually you do handset for something of that nature. For fear of uh, time, I will just jump over the lumbar drain stuff. I know that's how you it. <coughs> Um, so what is the purpose of ICP monitoring? Well, ICP monitoring, obviously based upon what we just discussed in the basic science portion of this conversation a few minutes ago, is to maintain and understand your components of CPP. Now you have a map, you have your ICP, you can appropriately manage CPP. And I think I didn't touch on it, but that's, it is an important thing. As we discussed, the trial literature is going back and forth uh, about what's more important, maintaining an appropriate cerebral perfusion pressure or minimizing ICP. And what they really found is that it's the abrupt increases in ICP that are more detrimental to the patient. So even if your ICP is 15 and your CPP is 55, there's no reason to like chase it. There, you, what they found is you don't necessarily need to chase the CPP. If your ICP is maintained within a normal range and there's not significant fluctuations, those patients end up doing much better. And if they don't do as bad as those patients where you're constantly changing the cerebral perfusion pressure. But obviously, as you can see, in that component, there's things that you'll be able to do. By increasing your intravascular volume, if the CVP is low, you can increase the MAP, which will help maintain your uh, cerebral perfusion pressure in the settings of elevated ICP. Right? So it's it's constant playing that numbers game and fluctuating things to the state of equilibrium. CSF, uh, removal of CSF, is one of those things, I think, you know, we do that with lumbar drains, we do it with our EDDs or our setups. The thing to maintain is complete sterility of the system. That's why, again, we realized, again, training for personally, uh, that you only have one or two people that are really withdrawing CSF from your patient to be sent for a specimen culture. And that's only done, in my experience here, in my uh, work here, I only do it when patients have elevations in temperature or there's concerns for infection. We used to do it on a routine basis, every three days, you could say. Some surgeons still do that. I think though, you know, we're all creatures of habit to a certain extent, and it's something that we learned and we were trained with, but I don't think it's necessarily appropriate because obviously if you have a normal health, a normal patient in the sense that no infection or site of infection, and you're constantly drawing CSF from the reports, so there's more potential for you to introduce infection into the system than there is from them getting an infection. So we've kind of minimized that personally, and with our team or my team, it's just myself and my physician assistant that draws CSF. I don't, we used to have the nursing staff, uh, we would educate them on how to do it, but we realized that um, obviously right, more people, more hands in the pot, and more potential for issues. So might as well take the responsibility on myself and my team to manage that. Um, <clears throat> you guys are getting this right now. So people that are managing EDDs or lumbar drains are going to be specifically trained in their area or competent in that management. After this, you guys are going to be Maintaining optimal cerebral perfusion, as we discussed, is probably the most paramount thing with ICP management. You're able to divert CSF and thereby minimize those things that are elevating your intracranial pressure, right? Cerebral perfusion is associated with your brain tissue perfusion. So, Munt Mineral Kelly Doctrine, as we discussed, elevations in ICP would cause fluctuations or elevation in CSF uh, would potentially cause movement of brain tissue and auto cerebral auto regulation with blood flow. So it's important, all those components act in, in unison with each other, so it's important to work with those as they increase or decrease in appropriately managing those. You're going to be monitoring your ICP on an hourly basis. Uh, the system is set up in such a way, if you haven't utilized it, that uh, you will have a constant ICP reporting depending on how you set up your A-line system that is attached to the Becker drainage bank. You can always and you should always clamp the system and check your ICP on an hourly basis. I wish I had a patient here in front of you because I can show you some of the tricks that we have in able, being able to assess if your waveform's dampened and just being able to see it. But if you, the one thing you can do is when you have your transducer set up, you can turn the stop clock away so that it's going straight to the transducer and you get a direct ICP report. But if you turn the stop clock and you go back to drainage, 
And if you take your, you maintain everything at level. So your leveling is going to be at the frame of the row, right? So where the patient's positioned at their tragus or right at their external auditory canal. This best gives you the intracranial component of it. It's set up at the frame of the row, which is right at the level of your third ventricle, which is where the catheter should ideally be placed. But what that does is, if you turn it away, you can see as it's being passed around, if you, if you unclamp the buretrol and you just raise it up, you'll see the fluid column within the, the drainage system go to a certain level, and it'll hover at that level. And if you look quickly over, you'll see that it's at 18 millimeters of mercury or 20 millimeters of mercury. That's like the cheat, so to speak. So if, you're at, if your monitoring system isn't working, that's a good way of double checking after you check with your monitoring system that your ICP is in accordance and the fluctuation should be ideal. I don't know if that makes sense completely, maybe I'm playing off a little, but like I said, if someone wants to know, we can discuss it later in the so. So again, the things you're going to be looking for is inspecting your EDD site. Infection, infection, infection. There's nothing else I can tell you. That's the biggest component of this that worries most of us or gives us not enough sleep at night. Um, is inspecting your insertion site, making sure that there's no cracks, there's no leaks. The dressing is placed, and I think it'll say it in a second, that you know, usually we change it about every 72 hours, unless it's saturated. Obviously, then contacting your team and having them come by and appropriately changing the dressing without causing injury to the catheter itself. What things can you do to minimize elevations in intracranial pressure? So obviously, this is, I think, the first and foremost thing. Making sure that your patient's head is appropriately maintained straight midline so that there's appropriate genus returned by the jugular. There's a quick and step in the bird, and I know it sounds barbaric, but one of the measures is you can place, and this was done obviously, both hands on the jugular and the fluid, and you'll see an acute rise in ICP. So that right there tells you that you have a component of cerebral autoregulation that's working appropriately. I wouldn't recommend going in and choking your patients. But <laughs> it's fun to do it. Um, <coughs> Another thing that's very important in maintaining uh, appropriateness of the management of these patients is ensuring that there's no straight fluctuations in the patient's bed position. Right, 30 degrees is usually what we maintain. I think our beds now are appropriately locked. Uh, you can minimize that. You guys have locking mechanisms uh, so that families can't come in there and say that you know grandma likes her sleep number 32. <laughs> um, obviously, I'll show you a few waveforms. For sake of time, we have to probably progress pretty quickly through this. At the end, I'm going to show you a few waveforms, and you're going to see an appropriate waveform with the three appropriate notches associated with ICP management. And you'll see what I'm talking about when one waveform rises above another. It should be one of the first signs that there is something or some sort of intracranial pathology is occurring, causing an acute elevation in ICP. Other things you can do, light noise. I mean, we used to do this back in the day, and our attendees used to talk about it all the time. You know, patients with subarachnoid hemorrhages for fear of them not rupturing again, putting them in a completely dark, quiet room. Sometimes there's some research out there, I'm sure you've seen, that talks about you know, playing some soothing music, and how you have to put the hand in the same way you've done with that. But, you know, monitoring your labs. So another measure that most people use is then increasing your rheology. Mannitol is a great medication that's used to diurese the patient, decrease the intravascular volume, but it can also minimize intracranial pressure by shunting fluid. And there's other methods that Manitol works, and I think that's beyond the scope of this, but it's one of the primary measures instituted by many people. Hypertonic saline is another one that kind of falls in the Manitol area, which I like to use because it also increases your intravascular volume, so your traumatic patients that's kind of nice that come in that like you know, alcoholics that got hit, that are dehydrated, and you give them Manitol, it's just going to bottom the pressure up. 3% is great because you increase the intravascular volume, but at the same time you pull fluid off the brain, so minimizing the CP. Urine output, obviously you want to monitor your urine output with these patients, uh, and this is kind of going towards the idea of DI or diabetes insipidus in patients with elevations greater than 200, 250 cc's an hour or every two hours with a spec grab less than 1005. I think that's something you obviously need to monitor with your serum osmolality when you're getting manitol every six hours or so. So again, just going through ICP management, you want to monitor and maintain that there's no significant stimulus if your patient's sedated and innovated, sedations on board and that it does not uh, stop for any reason or increasing your sedation to whatever you guys use in your institutions, GAS score, RAS score, whatever it may be. Confirm an appropriate volume status. 
Uh, that's obviously important again, going back to what we were discussing earlier, and maintaining an appropriate intravascular volume. We don't want to get some mannitol with a CVP of two, which is going to make for a bad situation. I think when you look at some of the absence of ICP waveforms, you know, air bubbles or clot debris within the drainage system, that's something to contact the team that's there so that we can come if we need to appropriately flush in the system. No one ever tells you to attach uh, flush to the system and try to correct that appropriately. I think that's something that uh, the primary team in places a catheter should be involved in. Again, I can't stress it enough, infection's the biggest thing that concerns all of us when it comes to these catheters, uh, so it's maintaining sterility. The one that's up front here, in fact, is a right rampant and menisicine included uh, catheter, which is great because it potentially uh, can prevent infection tracking on your tubing. Unfortunately, it also can potentially cause resistance to occur and get people more super bugs to uh, be a part of that uh, process. So we rarely use the right rampant included one, but it's good for those patients that have had persistent infections and still need PDD placement. Um, how much time do I have? One minute. One minute. Perfect. <laughs> so we'll just move forward. Uh, really the biggest thing, I think, when you go to the end, here you can see a picture of a patient with a uh, system set in place. Uh, right there you can see is where you want to make sure that they're leveled off appropriately right at the frame and row. This is in fact a little low if you want to be nitpicky about it. Some of the newer systems have laser levelers. I would recommend getting one because it's fun. Uh, otherwise, uh, you can just get, uh, I think, just a level and put it next to the bed, or you, know, you can do what I think is one of us did in this patient, which is just ear shot it. Uh, here you can see, I mean, not the best way to set up the system. Uh, there should be, what I was talking about is, you know, ideally some sort of sterile dressing wrapped around the tubing. Uh, this is not a big deal, but, you know, as long as not an ET tube or something's attached to that. And then you can see the rest of the system. Just real quick, I think that's probably the most important thing as far as things that you're going to be looking at uh, on a case-by-case -case basis with your patients is going to be your waveforms. And I think that's very important when you look at it. You have three waveforms, a P1, a P2, and a P3 waveform. Not to get too far into the science of it, everything is kind of a crescendo that's defining in a normal patient. So here you have a compliant brain showing you the normal waveform, elevation in P1 with a dichrotic notch, P2, and then P3. You'll see this waveform appropriately, and it'll mimic your heart rate, as a matter of fact, in your patient. If you start to see a precipitous incline of P2 against P1, that's when you know something bad's happening. That's one of the first things as far as waveform. In fact, you'll see this sometimes before you see the elevation in your, your numbering uh, system. You'll see. So I thought that would be one important thing for you guys to know I think that really covers it all. Um, obviously, there's a lot more to this, and we kind of swoop through a lot, but hopefully it's somewhat of made sense. If you did feel free to give personal lectures. Uh, but yeah, I think that's about it.